Wir möchten das jetzt gerne noch so ein bisschen zusammenführen, verarbeiten. Also wir bitten alle drei Referentinnen noch mal zu uns nach vorne und Matthias wird uns äh, noch eine kleine Diskussion moderieren und wir haben auch noch einen Special Guest von unserem Institut, Marc Steiner. Herzlich willkommen, danke, dass du dich auch noch anschließt. Ich übergebe jetzt an Matthias für eine kurze Diskussion, wo Sie auch alle gerne eingeladen sind, sich zu beteiligen, bevor es dann in die Kaffeepause geht. Ja, super. Merci vielmals, Florina, für die Einleitung, wie gesagt, jetzt haben wir sehr spannende Inputs gehört von ähm, spannenden Speakers. Wir wollen jetzt nochmal zu Englisch switchen und von dem her, um, I will switch now to English, uh, but we'll reflect on the <laughs> my AI, my human intelligence to switch to English, not like people. So um, we'll discuss a little bit the issues brought up. First of all, I'm very uh, warm welcome to Mark Steiner. He is, um, on the one side, senior practitioner at our institute, but also you're a professional judge, a real judge. Um, and uh, so therefore, um, it's interesting to hear a little bit uh, your, your thoughts about this topic and what do you think about deep judge and uh, things which the federal administration is planning and what also are the um, actual implementations? What did you think about? Okay, we have an internal deal that I have no more than two minutes to react on the speeches, so it's impossible to deal with all of those questions. But what's really uh, spot on is a reaction on Paulina's presentation, because it's spe specifically targeting law, and that's where we are. Uh, human lawyers are not machines, but sometimes they pretend to be, because they give the impression impression of not having choices where they have choices. And the point is that where they have choices, they need to take responsibilities. And that's the important thing. One of my hobbies is I try to consult Central Asian governments to introduce administrative procedural law because they were not used to challenge decisions of the government. I mean, in the Soviet era, it was obviously none of this in place. And the first reaction of those officials was, we would like to have a code of thousand articles dealing with each and every situation that the person applying the law doesn't need to take responsibility. And that would make out of them something like machines. But that's not the reality we live in. So the reality is not collecting argument, but giving weight to arguments based on set of values, dealing with biases, dealing with dissenting opinions, going for a vote, three to two judges in a public debate. That's the reality. And th that's why it's so interesting to have this exchange on how language can be processed in a way that it comes as close as possible to those real life uh, legal methods. And, and one thing is important to me also uh, as a literature scientist, which I used to be in the past before having been a lawyer, chess rules are clear. Language is a moving target. So this makes the, the whole game once again entirely different. And I mean, that could be a base for a discussion, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. So thank you very much. Please keep it. So on the other so in other words, you're not afraid that your job is going to be um, substituted with an AI. No, because I'm not dealing with legal commodities. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So maybe Pauline, would you like to reflect on or respond to Mark's statement? Yes, I think that's a very interesting perspective, maybe to comment on what you said. I don't think we're gonna replace judges or lawyers anytime soon. I think um, AI plus human really bids human alone or AI alone. And I think that's, that's really the future. And if we can empower these judges or lawyers with a lot of knowledge that they can very easily find and then support their arguments with that, we, that can also lead to even more interesting discussions and challenging the, the status quo. Okay, great. Thank you. So th this brings us to the interesting discussion also with you. So as the audience, you have now the opportunity to um, ask questions or actually respond to certain issues. 
personally, I have a couple of things which I would like to discuss, but maybe we'll start with the audience first, because you have now the opportunity to um, speak, and I have it the rest of the day. <laughs> So first, really thank for this very interesting presentation. I would actually really also have a question to Deep Dutch AI topic, because I find it, a, it is a very elegant domain model. But what I don't get is why it must be private if it is public data. Because as you mentioned, all the training stuff is public data. And if I search a context, the AI does not know why I'm looking for it. For example, if I'm a judge having a court case and I just search for the topic, the AI cannot recognize why I'm searching it. So the privacy context for this does not get into my understanding. Can you explain why you think it is important? Yes, that's an excellent question. And uh, the privacy comes in two different aspects. The first one is the query, so what you're searching for. And the second one is the data. And depending, so basically the documents that you're searching over. And depending on the particular use case, you may care or not care about the privacy. So if the documents are by nature public, then maybe you don't need to secure them, but maybe you do care about how you're describing your case and the query being seen, because there are also now advanced methods where you can just upload a brief and kind of describe your case, the current case, and it gives you supporting arguments like relevant rulings and relevant law articles. And then you can leak some kind of information perhaps about the case or the client. But for us, we are also dealing very heavily with sensitive documents. So for example, all the documents in the, within a law firm or a bank, and then by nature, they're, they're very highly sensitive and no one wants to send their data to open AI servers. ChatGPT is even blocked in most of these companies. So then if you really want to secure not only the queries that you're performing, but also the data, the documents themselves, then you really need to think about having a large language model that is private. I hope this answers your question. Okay, thank you very much. I think it's a very interesting issue about data protection, data privacy, and which comes up all the time. So, um, other questions from the audience? Okay, yes. So, as humans, I see that we strive to optimize our decisions and maybe evolve our decisions based on our experiences with what they have caused. And I also would like to be innovative, but if I see artificial intelligence, I think it's, um, I don't quite understand how artificial intelligence can also be innovative because it's based on um, previous decisions and based on what has been done usually. Good point, thank you. Would you maybe like to respond or Paulina again? <laughs> Difficult ones. I think actually you would be quite amazed to find how innovative these AI models can be. I think they can learn to combine different things and understand different things and then reformulate them in very innovative and creative ways. And an example for this is images. I think now it's really impressive if you describe a type of scene that you want to see or kind of what you wanted to convey, it's really shocking and it would take you a lot of designers maybe to come up with ideas like that. So AI models are innovative. That is not to say that it's gonna replace the innovation of humans as well. I think that aspect is still there. Okay, thanks. Any addition? Yes. I can, can try to, to answer uh, also the question. I think AI models are innovative. Nevertheless, they, they rely on existing data. Uh, I think the question that you ask is a, is a very good one. Uh, I, I don't think if we are really able this morning to answer your question. I think uh, it, uh, Innovation comes from different factors and perspective, and I think the day where this model will be able to reinvent themselves, claim the new the new rules for the, for for themselves based on the past, a little bit in the same way as what we are doing as a human, because we are not really different. 
we are uh, how are we creative that's a very good question at the end of the day we read a lot of things we hear a lot of things we have discussions with other people that create innovation at the end of the day and maybe i will is not a serious answer but nevertheless it's an answer i would say we should maybe you should ask yourself if we are able to do that maybe we'll also an algorithm now or later be able to have a little bit the same approach but uh, i don't have the perfect answer for that i think uh, it's currently we have maybe we have to discuss about how we innovate as human and when we have we answer this question we will be able to answer the question if mm -hmm. not always we will be in maybe in, in a few years able to overpass the or take the overtake mm -hmm. the, the the ability of human as some are talking about this point they are talking about 2035 where ai could uh yeah reach the point where mm -hmm. they know more of the humanity we'll see i'm not good at predicting the future I have to say. some some terminator vision almost <laughs> Maybe one, one small um, mm -hmm. mind experiment. If we feed AI all the music there is until 1900, would it, de would it develop jazz? And if it would develop jazz, would we recognize it as something good? Because I think the machine wouldn't recognize that it is really nice music. So this needs the, the feedback of humans. And the question is, if it would develop by accident jazz, would it just disappear in all the other things it would develop and but with the images as well it needs the human to say this is a good image or I like this and the machine for itself doesn't know oh this is really nice very good point thank you we're almost in philosophy now that's great um, any other comments great comments or questions please um, I think this can be summarized in one easy distinction. Um, we can use AI to describe what is, but we shouldn't describe it to what ought to be, which is a basic tenet of philosophy for the last couple of hundred years. And this goes into the same thing that you described as jazz. I mean, AI can recognize rules, what makes good music, but in the end, it needs to appeal to humans, at least now. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your comment. Any more reactions from the audience over there? Uh, you said that AI will not replace judges or, um, I don't know, other very quali qualified people, but what about persons with less education and less qualifications? I think the judge assistants made might be in danger, so I'm not sure. <laughs> Very good point. So what about the commodity issues? Anyone? Mark, maybe you know the business of the judges or the... <laughs> That's an interesting point. I mean, I think what makes us different from artificial intelligence, if we are well trained in our education, is critical thinking. And critical thinking means not only enabling people to live in difficult context, but to deal with moral dilemmata. And, and that's, so I think we can differentiate ourselves by better training and education and, and make us therefore less replaceable in that context. So we can do something about it. It, it just doesn't happen. <laughs> That's my view. Okay. But on the other hand, um, you want to replace certain um, tr traditional workers, or what is your plan? <laughs> so, our plan is really to, to replace a lot of the repetitive manual work that is there. And that type of work is present in a lot of different professions, including in the profession of judges and lawyers. Um, and I, and I really think that doesn't replace them, it just makes them better in the sense that they can really focus on 
what they want to do, what is fun to do, what is strategic to do, instead of spending hours and hours finding the, the ruling that was on this topic, or mm. hours and hours maybe redacting a document mm. by hand. Um, I think these things should be automated to some degree, or kind of they should support the user and help them in the first instance provide them with something, and then the, the user defines how to act on top of that. There are certain things that humans have as skills, also the creativity, the ideas behind something, um, and those are not going to be replaced. Like even with chat GPT, for example, if you take marketing, it can really write excellent marketing pieces, mm. but or like copyright, but you still need to tell it how to present the company, mm -hmm. uh, what is kind of the style that you want on your website. So there is still human thinking. I think that some of the professions are going to evolve a little bit in order to work and utilize AI. And we're going to learn to mm -hmm. work with the AI, kind of similar to how we have all adopted to work with mobile phones. They don't replace us. They make a lot of things much more optimal and, and easy to do. So I think we're going to evolve together slowly. <laughs> That sounds almost like Silicon Valley. Thank you very much. Um, maybe, but I would like to stick with this question because um, the point is that there are certain people who don't want or can't um, work in this way. So what do we do? What do these people do in the future? Yeah, I think uh, that's what I tried to mention in my, at the beginning of my presentation. Uh, here we are talking about the impact of AI on society. Okay, and if you hear the CEO of IBM, I think yesterday he said that he's thinking during the next uh, five years, if I'm not wrong with that, uh, that he will rethink the way he will hire a super function uh, because he's, he's really convinced uh, that uh, yeah, chat, uh, tools like ChatGPT could really change the rules. And I think that's probably also something that we should discuss when we discuss about the AI. What could be the impact? Uh, the, if you look at it a bit back in the history, the, the, uh, the transition from the second uh, industrial revolution to the third industrial revolution create new jobs. Or quite a lot of people had to change what they were doing. That it creates new job, and the, the question is a little bit a transition. But we will also have new jobs. But we also have to think a little bit about the society that yeah. how we want to deal with these changes. And I think to fight against that, it will be quite difficult because you have to survive on the market as a pri in the private sector. And if you have a competitive advantage when you use AI for your company, I guess quite a lot of CEO will do the, the step. But our role as society is really, also, is really also to think what could be the consequences to anticipate, anticipate these consequences in order to have a, maybe another, another another type of education, new skills to improve the, the competency of the people. Thank you, yeah, that's a very good point. So also about education in the end. Um, one more question, one final question. One more. Yeah, um, I have a question with regard to the general setup that we're currently in, you know, ChatGPT. The reach is limited uh, in terms of time scale. So it doesn't use really actual data. And uh, the content that is generated by JTPD and other tools is ever increasing. And this is an exponential growth, meaning JTPD is learning from a data set until it's limited to a time frame until 2021, I guess. But guess what? When JTPD works then an own generated content, you know, it's you're entering a loop. It's a massive explosion of internet content that gets generated, but like it's like circling around, you know, and it's getting more and more, and you get into those tunnels of information. And the question is, how, where does the real content, the new content, then come from? How do you see that exponential growth that is just triggered by these algorithms filling the internet and all our databases with content in an exponential way? So we need human content, not just machine content, in the end. Anyone? Very difficult question, I think. Yes? Yes, I think 
one thing that is really good for the current providers of large language models like OpenAI and ChatGPT is that they further can train their models based on the data that they produce and not so much necessarily of like the sentences themselves, but also on the human interaction, what, how people interact with these models, uh, what they say, whether you put thumbs up or thumbs down. And I think that makes them even more and more powerful. So they're really in a position of strength to not only have exponential amount of data, as you're saying, but also to learn from, from the human interaction. Mm -hmm. That's where actually I like very much in your open assistance approach, where you open up the crowdsourced data. That's where I think is very promising. We are at the end of the time. So thank you very much for all the discussion and the questions. I hand over back to Florina and applause for the participants, please. Thanks.